social pressure between bucks is absolutely fascinating. I mean, I view it much like a ladder. They each have their own personality just like humans. Most of them do want to be the man. And what those dominant bucks do is they actually suppress those subordinate bucks. They intimidate them. Believe it or not, it's not all food plots and fun running around chasing does for a whitetail. We do not as hunters and managers put anywhere near the level of importance as we should on controlling social stress. Social stress is a really, really big deal in the whitetail world. Whitetail TV. To hunt deer, you have to know deer. That is the whole premise behind deer and deer hunting. That's why deer and deer hunting was the first whitetail source in America, to understand deer behavior. The more you know about deer behavior, the better hunter you're going to be, no matter where you're hunting in the country and no matter what you're going for. I'll tell you what, very few things in this world fascinate me anywhere near as much as population dynamics, social structure within the whitetail world. It's such an incredibly complex puzzle to try to put together. One of the first things a whitetail stresses about is dispersion, finding that home territory. And this is especially true of bucks. These bucks need to find their own little niche territory. They're driven out of where they were raised and growing. How would you like to be kicked out of your home? And then they kind of wander around and hopefully fall into a place that they like. As a buck goes from three years old to four years old to five years old, they get smarter. And guess what? Their home ranges, their core ranges get smaller. Does that make sense? Why would his core range get smaller? It makes perfect sense because as that deer gets older, he knows precisely where he can be safe. The mature bucks, there's personality differences, no doubt, but I am thoroughly convinced that most mature bucks, they don't want to get in those fights because they've been in them before. They realize how incredibly stressful it is on them. That rut is super, super stressful. For one thing, these bucks are all competing for does, and at a certain point, there's just a few does coming into heat. They want to have that first chance to breed that first doe. There's a lot of stress there because the big boys, they're pushing the small boys around. As a buck gets older, he's gonna exhibit certain characteristics that may be beneficial or not beneficial for the deer herd that you're hunting. In certain situations, a dominant buck might not be the biggest buck, and that might be a buck you want to take out. That's a buck you want to target, because if you get him out of the herd, it's going to allow some of these younger deer that have more desirable antler traits to take over and occupy the space where that buck was. So what you're doing is you're making holes. Since we can only hold so many on this property, no, we cannot alter genetics, but we can alter the standing stock of our bucks because the social stress level gets so darn high between these mature bucks that what they do is they set out to try to kill each other. That is where shooting management bucks actually comes into play. Let's go ahead and kill that five and a half, six and a half year old eight point that isn't going anywhere, who is dominant. So does have a lot of stress in their life as well during this rut period. Now that ends when they come into heat, they're looking for a suitor to take them out on a date. But before and after, there is a lot of chasing going on. The social pressure and stress from the female segment is basically what drives the whitetail herd. It is absolutely fascinating. Those does, the females, they live on the landscape in interconnected circles. So it's one big extended family. 
the most dominant does, the healthiest does, they're gonna occupy the high rent areas of the property. They're gonna have some fawns with them and last year's fawns with them, but guess what? Those get pushed out based off of their ranking in the herd, their pecking order. The stress that's involved with that jockeying for position is what drives deer behavior, it, what drives how many deer you're gonna have on your property, and what drives essentially your hunting prospects in fall. By offering deer multiple areas where they feel safe, what you're doing is you're reducing competition, you're reducing social stress. You're spreading that out more across your property and because of that, you can hold more and bigger deer. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Cuddyback Digital, more deer, fewer blanks. By Sig Sauer Electro Optics, never settle. By Thompson Center, America's master gun maker. Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. And by Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Plus technology. Apply it, dry it, and go hunt. So you're managing your piece of ground for whitetails. You've established food plots, bedding areas, and water sources. You've even placed multiple stands for different conditions. But now, because you have the best food, you, because you have the best water, feeling of safety, comfort factor, breeding opportunities, you have more deer than the rest of the area does. Okay, so your buck numbers are higher than the rest of the areas, but you can only hold so dang many, and that's where social stress comes back in again. It gets to the point where it's too much of a hassle, it's too stressful on that buck to sit here and fight over this area. But you know what, across the fence it's not. There isn't a mature buck to be found over there, so he jumps the fence. It's within his home range. He's not shifting his home range, but he's shifting his core area over there. When you're managing any property, no matter where you're at, really helpful information is the social pressure that deer have on the landscape. This is some heady stuff. We talk about it all the time. We've reported about it in deer and deer hunting for years through some of the scientific research papers that we've published. Picture getting picked on back in high school or in grade school. You know, how bad do you want to walk down the hall? You know, past lockers of the guys that are picking on you. So social stress is very, very hard on these bucks. When that buck has to assume that subordinate role, it suppresses absolutely everything about him. You can even see it in antler development. So often that dominant buck is killed the very next year, the one who is next in line, his rack all of a sudden makes a disproportional jump. Stress levels is what we're worried about. Once you're able to spread out this social stress, don't forget that Mother Nature may affect the movement of your deer herd as well. It doesn't matter if you're hunting the east coast, the west coast, north or south, wind can and will invade your hunt. Now, regular wind that deer are used to on a day-to-day -day basis isn't a huge issue, but high winds, extreme winds, that can change the patterns of the deer. One thing that some of the new GPS research tracking is showing though, is that regardless of the wind and weather, unless it's a unique huge storm, deer are gonna travel about the same amount every day. GPS research shows that, so you just have to understand that they may not move in the same patterns that you're used to. When the wind blows, they're probably gonna be in a little bit thicker cover in a little bit deeper ravine or even down in a canyon or a coulee. So think that. Don't just not go hunting because the wind is screaming like it is here today in Nebraska, but instead hunt smart. Hunt where the deer want to be. They're going to move, so you just need to move to where they're at. The buck I'm after He's been routinely coming out to this food source. I'm not talking every day. I'm talking numerous times a day. I am quite certain, I mean obviously I cannot prove this, but I am quite certain that the reason he keeps coming out over and over and over again is because man, he's got it made. 
He has the best daylight core bedding area in that area. He's dominating this food source. He's got girls up the wazoo. He's got food, he's got water, he's got comfort. He's got everything he wants right here, okay? That guy who's on the next rung of that ladder right beneath him, he wants what he has. So this buck keeps coming out over and over and over again to check on these does. I actually passed up this buck once. Early season, I went back to hunt a different buck in this area. You know, I had him at 15 yards quartering away, head down eating. And I'm sitting there with my Matthews in my hand and I'm thinking, do I, do I really want to end this that fast? You know, I mean, this is a great buck and I'd love to shoot him, but at the same time, I don't want my season to be over yet. Okay, frankly, that's part of the reason why I was going after this other buck is because he was a lot tougher. This is on heavily managed ground. These are not what I would consider real world deer, but at the same time, a five and a half year old buck's not an idiot. You know, why is he keeping coming out over and over? Oh, he's afraid he's gonna lose this place to one of those many other bucks on the way up. You know what? I'm gonna spend the first two and a half days of shotgun season hunting the buck that I was after originally in a different location. But if I haven't tagged out, that last half day of first shotgun season, I'm heading right back there, and you know what? I'm betting I'm gonna kill him. I get back in there, sure enough, it isn't more than, it isn't more than a half hour, and there he's out feeding with does. You know, he's feeding, he's feeding, he's feeding, and then he decides to check the grass area. As he's checking the grass area, he gives me the shot I need. Steve recovers his buck. This is Land of Whitetail. This segment of Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Matthews. I get back in there, sure enough, it isn't more than, it isn't more than a half hour and there he's out feeding with does. You know, he's feeding, he's feeding, he's feeding, and then he decides to check the grass area. As he's checking the grass area, he gives me the shot I need. I'm telling you, this buck had absolutely everything to do with social pressure. He was paranoid as heck over losing what he had, so he kept checking it and checking it and checking it again. Social pressure is very significant on the whitetails. We can use it to our advantage, such as I did right there. We can also do calling and rattling, or we can watch it decimate our bucks. It really comes down to something about that simple. Social structures in deer, you have the male segment and the female segment. The male segment is the one everybody likes to talk about. Somebody like Steve Bartilla has some great insights on the male structure of the herd, how mature bucks intermingle and we know that a mature buck's core range gets smaller as he gets older there's a reason for that because when that deer tries to travel outside of that core area he's getting beat up by other bucks so he learns that i gotta live in this smaller area you cannot alter genetics but you sure can alter the standing stock of bucks on your ground by removing those more mature bucks that are expressing less antler potential then these young studs, what you're doing is you're making holes for those young studs to fill. How much gear do you bring into the field? Mark Kaiser shares a way to lighten your load a bit. Plus, we have a fresh installment of Growing Big. This is Land of Whitetail. Land of Whitetail is brought to you by Cuddyback Digital. More deer, fewer blanks. 
by Sig Sauer Electro Optics. Never settle. By Thompson Center, America's master gunmaker. Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. And by Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Plus technology. Apply it, dry it, and go hunt. As whitetail hunters, we've got a bad habit. We like to take all this great gear and gizmos into the field. Case in point, right here, I've got everything in this day pack, including the kitchen sink, stuff I'll probably never use. But one area I've pared down is in my optics. I no longer take a separate range finder and a binocular. Nikon's Laser Force 10 by 42 range finder binocular, it's all in one package. I know what you're saying, that's too expensive. Well, up until now, it might have been. For approximately $1,200 though, what you would likely pay for a separate range finder and a binocular, all in one package. You no longer have to take out a mortgage or a second mortgage on your house to get a great laser range finder binocular. It's got extra low dispersion glass, multi-coating throughout all the lenses and prisms, it's got a die cast metal body that's rubber armorized. This thing is tough. It's ergonomically friendly, waterproof, it's fog proof, nitrogen filled. It has incline decline technology. You're always gonna get an accurate reading, whether you're ranging down into a deep canyon or up a steep hillside. Tree stand hunters, yeah, that's the product for you. I can go on and on, but really, you just need to get one of these in your hands. Check it out, and you're gonna be sold. You're gonna uh, no longer wanna be taking the kitchen sink with you and just taking these. Oh, and maybe some Hornady ammo, and your rifle, and of course the grunt call, and the rattling antlers, and oh, what else? Let me just think. When we're out here improving our ground, we really need to look at it both from the macro and the micro standpoint. Macro, always design a plan before you start making any improvements. That means, how are the deer using my property now? What works well for topography? What do I have for cover? What do I have for food, for water? All that type of good stuff. Analyze what you have and come up with a macro approach. How can I get the deer to use my ground, wasting more time than they are now, in the way I want them to? That takes a big picture view. That takes looking at what the neighbors have, what they don't have, what I have, what I don't have, and then try to, try to fill in the gaps. Take our weaknesses, jack them up through the roof, raise raise them up to strengths, and at the same time take our strengths and put them on steroids. All while laying out these improvements in a way that causes deer to flow through our ground. Not just move randomly, but have, have very easily understandable patterns on how they're going to use our ground. That's the macro view, and frankly, as I said, you really need to consider what's going on in the neighbors in order to come up with a real sound macro plan. Now, once we've done that, now it comes down to micro planning. What I mean by that is, don't go out, put in a food plot, you know, geez, I really need a food plot here. If I had a food plot just 20 yards, 50 yards, 70 yards in off that egg field, all the deer would go ahead and stage up there in the afternoons before they go out to the field after dark. You know, it works great, especially if I, if that large egg field happens to be a neighbor's. And then in the morning, they should hit this nice little staging kill plot before you know, going back to bed. I can slip in and slip out. That, that's all awesome. But, but don't go ahead and put in that food plot and then figure out where I'm going to put my stand. That doesn't work well. Instead, do the reverse. Go into that area, find that tree, find that location you're gonna set up. Now, then, go ahead and build those improvements around it. That micro view when it comes to actual stand placement is very, very important. The other thing to consider in this is how am I gonna get in, how am I gonna get out? 
That is huge. That is huge. Oftentimes, I want to, I, in the macro plan, geez, a food plot would seem to be good here. But if I shift it over here just a little bit, I can still take advantage of the flow between bedding and feeding. And I can go ahead and slip in and slip out undetected. So first look at it a macro view and then a micro. When it comes to habitat improvements, you got to have a plan. And your plan is really a macro plan. Now you have to incorporate the neighbors, what's going on in their ground, what's going on in mine, how are the deer using the property, and come up with a general, a general flow for how you want the deer to use that property in a way that works out best for us as hunters. Okay. Now when it comes to making individual improvements, if you're going to be hunting them, you have to look at it at a micro level. Instead, where am I putting that stand? Where am I putting that stand now? How can I build around that in a way that creates safe wind directions that I can get in and out and that's highly effective? Use both the macro and the micro approach and you're gonna be a lot further ahead. Growing Big with Steve Bartilla.